Mark the sixth chapter. Mark chapter six, beginning at verse one. And we're going to simply read through verse number five. Mark chapter six, beginning at verse one and reading through verse number five. Amen. The King James text today reads, <coughs> excuse me, and he, meaning Jesus, went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin, and in his own house. Now listen to verse 5. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk, and healed them. Amen. I want to talk to us today for a while on the topic Depends on who you see. Amen. Depends on who you see. Let's go to the Lord one time in prayer. Master, once again, oh God, we come before the throne of grace boldly as the word of the Lord declares it's our privilege as children of God. Master, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for that promise that one day there will be no need for light in that city, for the Lamb shall be the light thereof. Master, in the name of Jesus, anoint today, O God, your messenger. Anoint today my feeble lips that would try to do the word of God justice, that would try, O God, to be faithful in that sacred task of bringing a word of encouragement, a word of hope, a word of help, and healing and salvation to the hearer. Lord, I can't do it alone, never could, never have wanted to try. But I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Touch my body, touch my mind, touch my lips this hour that I might deliver this message, O oh God, that I know you've laid on my heart for the people of God. Help me to deliver it in a manner that will bring glory and honor to your name, and Lord, in a manner that <coughs> will permit it not only to be heard in the hearing, but Lord, in a manner that will permeate every obstacle and every obstruction in our life until it reaches the heart and causes us, O oh God, to lay hold of the truth that I'm about to articulate, that we might be recipients of the blessing and the miracles that you have in store for us. For we ask it all and none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I am having... I'm having a dignity of a time today. <clears throat> My allergy, I'm all right. I think so. 
Amen. Depends on who you see. As we approach the Christmas season, our minds are turned to the identity of the child born in the manger some two millennium ago. The ability to exercise faith and to receive blessings and miracles from the Lord has as much to do with how we perceive the Lord and who we see when we look at Jesus as it does our ability to believe that God is able or that God is willing to do that which we need for Him to do. Now I know that was a lengthy statement, so let me kind of break it down for you. Folks, how you see the Lord Jesus Christ has as much to do, if not more, with whether or not you will be able to receive a blessing or receive a miracle from Him, it has as much or more to do with your ability to receive from God as your faith does. See, a lot of people believe that God is able and they believe that God has the power and God has the capability, but they still don't quite look at Jesus right. Oh my goodness. And as long as you're not seeing him right, then there's a good possibility that you're cutting off your supply line from heaven. There's a good possibility that the reason you cannot get and you cannot receive from heaven what you need is not because you don't believe God is able, but it's because when you look at Jesus, you're not seeing him for who he is. Oh my goodness. It depends on who you see. When you look at Jesus, I'm going to tell you, there are, entire, there are entire organizations, there are entire religious movements that preach Jesus in a certain way and in a certain light. And they present Him in a certain fashion. And it's because of the way that they picture the Lord and the way they paint a picture of the Lord for their congregants, <laughs> it is because of that 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 entire movement or that entire denomination or that entire uh, religious organization is not able to receive miracles and they're not able to receive answered prayer and they're not able to receive from God what they have need of because it's all about who they see when they look at Jesus. You see, the Lord had gone back to his hometown. He had gone back to the area of Nazareth where he had been raised as a child. And in that area, all people could see was the little boy who grew up in their community. All they could see was, well, wait a minute, isn't this, you know, the carpenter? Isn't this uh, this one's brother? And, and aren't his sisters living here? For those of you who want to believe Mary was a perpetual virgin, that is a lie that has been perpetuated by Rome for uh, centuries. It is a lie from hell. The Word of God tells us he had brothers and he had sisters which came after him, okay? And that was part of what made accepting him and understanding who he was so much more difficult. Part of what made it harder for people in his hometown to see him as anything more than Mary's son or the carpenter 
or the little boy who grew up in our community. Well, he went to school with my kids. He used to play with my kids. I know this kid. I know who this is. You know, I'm familiar with this boy. I've seen him from his earliest days. I remember him from his youngest days. I, I don't see anything special here. See, now all the other people that Jesus preached to, all they saw was a grown man with a fully developed ministry teaching and preaching and performing miracles. Do you follow what I'm telling you? You see, they had the opportunity to see a very different picture of Jesus. Therefore, they were able to understand him and accept him as somebody very different than his hometown. But you know, the Lord said, hey, <laughs> a prophet's not without honor. A prophet will be honored everywhere he goes. The only problem he'll ever have is in his own hometown and amongst his own kin. I'm going to tell you, when God called me to preach and I told my family that God called me to preach, I never had more naysayers and more negative Nellies and more people who throughout the course of my life who have tried to discourage me and who have tried to talk me out of my calling than I have in my own family. I remember when I had come to Texas as a teenager and then my mother came down and my mother wanted me to go back to Connecticut with her and I did not want to go. I felt like, hey, God called me to Texas. If he didn't call you and you want to go back, you go back. But God called me to come down here and, and there was a big ruckus going on between my mother and I and brother Gillum told me he said Chuck why don't you go back with her son he said if the Lord wants you back here he number one he knows why you're going back you're not going to disobey him you're going to keep peace he said but he'll make a way for you to come back so I felt like that was the word of wisdom from brother Gillum I felt the wisdom, I felt the anointing of the Holy Ghost as Brother Gillum spoke those words to me. I just felt the Spirit of the Lord witnessing to my spirit that this is what I should do. So that's what I did. And I went back to Connecticut. And while I was in Connecticut, I'm telling you, God knows how to do things. And boy, does he know how to do things right. That's why I say don't ever worry about God's timing. I know that we wish God would work a whole lot quicker. We wish the Lord would do things a whole lot different. But I'm going to tell you a little secret about God. You won't never do it any better than He can. You won't never do it any better than He can. Trust me. Been there. So I go back to New England with my mother and I was unhappy. I was miserable. I knew I didn't belong there. I knew I belonged in Texas. I knew I did. And oh, I was so miserable. And normally when I would go back up home, I would go to the West Haven Church of God, which was the nearest church of God to me since I had become part of the church of God. But the assembly of God that I grew up in was a lot closer and I didn't have a car of my own at the time so I couldn't drive to West Haven too readily so <clears throat> instead I went to church with my mother to the church I grew up in well the pastor that I had left the church uh, as a teenager when I left the church and went to Texas in 1982 the pastor brother Harmon had gone on vacation and he was going to be gone for a full week, week and a half and a man who grew up in the same church I did, a man who was born and raised in the same church I was born and raised in he had, matter of fact, he was my mother's age, he was in my mother's uh, age bracket she had grown up with him, known him her whole life. Everybody in my family, all my aunts, all my uncles, my grandmother, everybody knew 
This man, his name was Nori. Everybody knew Nori Kokel. Well, guess what? While the pastor was on vacation, Nori was going to come and preach in his stead. Well, they had not seen Nori in literally 15 years. Because here I am now, 16 years old. And when he left the church to go out on his own ministry and what have you, uh, I was under a year old. That's the last time he saw me. I was just a baby. And so everybody in my family was excited. They were thrilled. Oh, Nori Kogel's coming to preach for us. How exciting, how exciting. Everybody loved Nori. Everybody thought the world of Nori. And this man comes and I don't know him from Jack the Ripper. I was less than a year old when he left our church. And literally he has not been back. Not one time in all these years. Well, let me tell you. Everybody in my family packed that church. So they could hear Nori Kokel preach. Because after all, this was somebody they knew. This was somebody they loved. This was somebody they admired. Nori was preaching. I think, if I remember correctly, he preached on Sunday morning. And then Sunday night, I think is when it happened. I was sitting in my favorite little spot, second pew back. I like to sit right up front. I don't like sitting in the back. I like to sit right up front where the action is. I was sitting in the second pew back as you walk down the center aisle of the church on the left hand side and I'm sitting in the second pew I'm on the inside aisle right there on the inside aisle right, right in clear shot of the pulpit well Nori's like me he don't preach behind the pulpit he gets out you know and he walks around and he's walking across where the altars are and he's walking across the platform and as he's preaching he's walking up the center aisle of the church and there were times when he would literally walk past me you know and I'd be sitting there looking down at my Bible reading while he's talking you know and all that I didn't bother turning crick in my head to see him you know all of a sudden all I know is I later found out that he had a mic with a wire he took the mic and he put it under his arm like this and he swung around on his heels and he plastered his hands on my forehead and that man began to prophesy and he began to, to prophesy and, and there were three elements of his proper, of his prophecy that were exactly what I had been telling my family for years concerning my call to preach. Oh, the Lord said, I've called you to preach. I've called you to a prophetic office. You're going to preach things that are going to make people mad. People are going to look at him and say, he's insane. He's crazy. That's when Nori prophesied that people are going to call me crazy. <sighs> he started his prophecy out with the first part of the first chapter of the book of Jeremiah before I formed thee in thy mother's womb I called thee and anointed thee a prophet and on and on and on the first several verses of Jeremiah uh, chapter 1 and I used to run to my mother and my grandmother I'd say I was praying the other day and I was telling Lord I couldn't understand how he could call me because I never felt ever felt like I was anybody that God should be calling or would call. But one day I was praying and talking to the Lord. And I told you, you just tell the Lord and sometimes he'll say, open the book. And I opened my Bible and I cast down my eyes and I began to read. And it was the first few verses of Jeremiah where he said, Say not that I am a child, for I have put my words in your mouth. And you know, and... And I'd gone to my grandmother, my mother. I'd shared this with different people in the family. And of course, most of them went, uh -huh. All of a sudden, Nori Kogel's prophesied over me. And he literally began the prophecy 
with that exact passage of Scripture. He literally quoted about the first five or six verses of that chapter. That's how the prophecy began. And then I told my family, I said, God told me that I was going to have a prophetic ministry. And I really, as a kid, when the Lord told me that, I didn't know what prophetic meant. You know, growing up in a Pentecostal church, I, I really, and it was so funny, I was telling Tommy the other day, when I was a kid in church, I used to get up to testify. And the Holy Ghost would anoint me. And I would begin to preach. And I'm literally 8, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. And the Holy Ghost would, and I'd start preaching. Just preaching and preaching. And I mean preaching, honey. And even my uncle David, my Aunt Laurel's husband, said to my mother one time, he said, you do realize that when Chuck's doing that, that the Holy Ghost has anointed him and he's prophesying, don't you? And my mother said, uh-huh. But I didn't understand what prophetic ministry was. You know, I didn't understand exactly. So when I don't understand something, I ask the Lord for clarification. So I said, okay, Lord. I said, well, if you've called me to prophetic ministry, then where in the Bible is there somebody who has a ministry that is or was prophetic so that I can kind of get a sense of what prophetic means, you know. And he said, you will have a ministry like that of John the Baptist. Well, when he told me that, I began to study everything I could lay my hands on about John the Baptist. And what I found out about John the Baptist was, he was one of the most hated and one of the most liked. <laughs> he had a good following, but he also wasn't very well liked because he was extremely plain spoken. He didn't mince words for nobody. He was the antithesis of pretentious. He didn't dress to impress. He didn't care if you like the label on his clothes or if you like the kind of car he drove or the address that he lived at. Didn't matter to him no kind of way. John was not one who was worried about PR. He wasn't worried about keeping up a certain image. I said, okay, well, so far I see some similarities. He said, but John's ministry was about making the path of the Lord straight as the Messiah was arriving. His ministry was about, the Bible said, filling in the low places and bringing down the high places. So John would bring the religious down to size. He would bring the hypocrites down to size. But he would elevate those who had been hurt and those who had been wounded and those who had been trodden upon. And he was trying to make level ground, so to speak. And I said, okay, so that's what my ministry is going to look like. So the Lord used the first chapter of Jeremiah. He said, I have a prophetic ministry. He said, my ministry be like that of John the Baptist. All of a sudden, Nori Kogel's prophesying over me. He starts out with the first several verses of Jeremiah 1. Then he moves into, I've called you to a prophetic ministry. I've called you to declare, thus saith the Lord. I've called you to say what I put in your mouth to say and not to care about the reaction or the response of your audience because that's not your job. Your job is to declare, thus saith the Lord. And then he goes into, just like John the Baptist. And he goes into this big long diatribe about how my ministry was like that in John the Baptist. After church, <laughs> my family was... 
every aunt, every uncle, every cousin I had was in that building. And God confirmed my calling through a man who didn't know me from Jack the Ripper, but a man that they loved and they respected and they admired. Had I not gone back to Connecticut as I did, that would have never happened. But see, God took something that the enemy meant for evil and he turned it to good. And then, long story short, he opened up a, a job for me to do a painting job for a lady. I made the money I needed and I was able to go right back to Texas. That night after church, I got in the car and my mother was sitting there. And she said, you're going back to Texas if I've got to pay your way myself. <laughs> because all of a sudden she realized that this 16-year-old son of hers, oh, thank you, Jesus. When I said God called me to Texas, I wasn't kidding. God called, And I knew God had called me to Texas, and I knew that's where I was supposed to be. And she and I had fought over it for weeks, you know, before coming back from Texas. So my mother said, you're going back if I have to pay for your way myself. And she didn't have to because the Lord made a way for me to go. The point is this. The Lord said that your biggest enemies, are, gonna, are not enemies, but your biggest detractors, shall I say, are going to be those of your own household and your own community. I remember when God called me to preach, I mean, excuse me, when God spoke to me to start my first church. I grew up in a real small community in southern New England. I grew up in a tiny little town that was nestled in the heart of a valley and there were just towns north of us and towns south of us. Every single town to the north and the south was ten times bigger than we were. We were just this little nut in the middle of all this, you know. And you drive up the road alongside of the river at the foot of the valley. Literally, I mean, this, this is how I grew up. <laughs> Very Norman Rockwell. <laughs> You drive along the river on the highway, you know, and you went right through our town, didn't even know you'd been there. And all the towns to the north of us were bigger, and the towns south of us were bigger. And I had done my internship in the Church of God after I did come back eventually from Texas. I did my internship at the West Haven Church of God under Brother Douglas Carver. And uh, the Lord laid on my heart to start a church in the valley. And I said, Lord, the valley? I grew up here. I grew up in the valley. I grew up here. I said, oh my God, have mercy. Aren't you aware <laughs> that the Bible said that a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and so on and so forth? But I'm telling you, God is, it's amazing how the Lord works sometimes. Because my reputation as a kid growing up helped me. The Catholic man who used to cut my hair as a kid said to me one day, he said, Chuck, I used to cut your hair. He said, all you ever talked about was God. All you ever talked about was preaching. All you ever talked about is this is what God called you to do. He said, son, I, it said, I know you. Everybody knew me. When I started my first church and I went around the community as time went on over the over the months, I'd bump into people that I knew from the church I grew up in or from, you know, and I was never interested in proselyting anybody. Matter of fact, I had a couple of people in my church from the church I grew up in. Sam was one, a fellow that played the drum. He, uh, I don't want to use his full name, but Sam 
uh, had been a member of the church I grew up in, and I bumped into him one day in the valley, and I told him I'd started a church. He said, oh, really? Well, I'll have to come check it out. He came, he loved it, he stayed, you know. I wound up with people that, that I grew up with, part of my church. My grandmother loved my church. My great-grandmother loved my church. I had cousins that loved my church. I had aunts and uncles that loved my church and eventually started coming and being a part of our church. So really, things shocked me the way things played out, you know, in my first church. But the point I'm trying to make is, it's all about how people see you. Part of the reason that I was so successful, even though I was in my own backyard, so to speak, is because people knew me. And they knew, all this kid's ever talked about is preaching. All this kid's ever talked about is God. All this kid's ever talked about is the church. This is the direction he'd been going in his whole life. So nobody was surprised. My nickname in high school was Rev. Kids used to come to me for counseling and and, and when they had emergency situations. When I was in high school, you know... They knew my reputation. But now here's Jesus. He grew up with my kids. He played with my kids. You know, he grew up in this community. There ain't nothing special about him. What's so special about him? How is it that I've heard in some of these other places, he's done such miracles and he's done such wonderful things. I don't understand it because I know the kid. He's nothing special. Well, I'm going to tell you folks how you see the Lord Jesus Christ has a lot to do with whether or not your faith is going to pay off for you in your life and in your walk with Him. The biggest mistake one can make is thinking that they know who Jesus is. Especially those who reduce Him to nothing more than the man next door. See, Satan loves groups like Jehovah's Witness. He loves them. <laughs> They're on his payroll, honey. You know why? Because they'll tell you, oh, he's just a man like every other man. He just created being like every other created being. Ain't nothing special about him. Pow! Guess what? You ain't never going to get nothing from God. You are never going to experience a miracle. You're never going to see a miracle. You're never going to know a miracle. Why? Because you don't believe that God is big and God is able. No, it's because of how you look at Jesus. Because how, how, who, how you see Him and who you see when you look at Him plays a very important role in whether or not you're going to receive from God. A very important role. I have a book that I've read a few times over the past 40 years written by a former Jehovah's Witness man. He and his wife had a child who was... Uh, born with a club foot or something to that effect, a deformed leg, you know. They made a mistake. They were reading their Bible, and instead of letting the Watchtower Bible Society tell them what everything meant and what everything was supposed to mean, they read a passage where Jesus said, Ask anything! In my name, he said, and I will do, I will do it for you. And the man said, well, we wanted our child healed so bad. We wanted our child normal so bad. Said that my wife and I were talking and we said, well, why don't we try it? Why don't we go ahead and do it? So they prayed and they asked God to heal their child's leg in Jesus' name. And literally, literally, 
I think it was the next day or something, he said that his wife and he were sitting in the living room and the kid was there on the floor and all of a sudden they looked down and they realized, oh my God, they looked at his leg. The kid's leg was normal, completely normal. They went to their local watchtower. They were so excited, oh my God, you're not going to believe this. They went to the fellowship hall. Oh, God, to tell you what God did. <laughs> and boy, they were sent down and told to shut up. We don't believe that. God don't do that. That's not how things work. And they were in a they were in a conundrum because they said, "But wait a minute, wait a minute, but 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 that's what the Bible says." Yeah, but that's not what we tell you the Bible says. I want to tell you, there's a lot of people out there loosening out with God. There are a lot of people, I want to tell you, say, if you think the message, the church you preach it, that you attend preaches, if you think the message in that church doesn't affect your walk with God and whether or not you can walk in blessing and walk in favor and experience miracles, honey, you are wrong! Their message has everything, everything to do with whether or not you'll be in a position. Because they're going to help formulate who you see when you look at Jesus. And it all depends on who you see. Glory to God, amen. Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 through 58. Again, the Word of God said, And when He, Jesus, was come into His own country, He taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence, come, whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. Again the word of the Lord said, verse 58, And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. What was their unbelief founded in? What caused their unbelief? How they saw Jesus, who they saw when they looked at this man they called Jesus. I'll tell you how you define Jesus and who you see when you look at Jesus makes all the difference in the world, folks, as to whether or not you'll ever have the faith to lay hold of a miracle or to receive what you need from the Lord. In Matthew 17, verses 14 through 20, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire, and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faith, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Or how long shall I have patience with you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, 
Ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. If all it takes is faith as the grain of a mustard seed to move a mountain, folks, then there has to be some issue that's greater than faith that causes our problem. You hear what I'm telling you? What on earth could prevent you from having even that little tiny granule of faith? That's all you need, the Lord said. To move them out, all you need is that little... So something has to be powerful enough. Jesus could not, the Word of God said, He could not perform any great miracles in His hometown. He couldn't do things in the area He grew up in. Why? Because of their unbelief. What was their unbelief founded in? It was all anchored in how they saw Him. Do you know what prevents 99.9% .9 of people who call themselves Christians from receiving the miracle and the blessing and the healing and the deliverance and the salvation that they need from God? Do you know what prevents them? It's lack of faith because when there's no faith, God cannot do. See, you notice the Word of God said the Lord could there do no, no great work. He couldn't do anything. Why? His hands were tied. Why? Because of their unbelief. But what was the cause of their unbelief? How they saw Him. Who they saw Him as. Oh, children, I'm here to tell you, it depends on who you see today. In Matthew 14, 24 through 31, But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Pastor, why are you sharing these passages? You've talked about these recently. I'm trying to help you understand. God deals in the realms of faith. There has to be faith. Faith has to be present in order for God to do anything. Without faith, His hands are tied. But what is the greatest enemy of our faith? Who we see when we look at Jesus. Hebrews 3, 15 through 19, While it is said today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in 
because of unbelief. Saints, I'm here to tell you, a lot of people are not entering in to the place of blessing. A lot of people are not entering in to the place of divine favor. A lot of people are not entering in to the place of miracles simply because they lack faith and their faith is lacking because when they look at Jesus, they're not seeing who they need to see. Because it all depends on who you see. Oh my Lord, in Matthew chapter 8, 23 through 27, and when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves but he was asleep and his disciples came to him and awoke him saying Lord save us we perish and he saith unto them why are ye fearful O ye of little faith then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great calm now listen to verse 27. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this? <laughs> Whew. That even the winds and the sea obey him. Oh my God. We've seen him heal the leper. We've seen him open blind eyes. We've seen him unstop deaf ears. We've seen him cast out devils. We've seen him call Lazarus out of the grave. But all of a sudden now, in this circumstance, we're standing here looking at each other, asking the question, what manner of man is this? My God have mercy. It's all about when you see him, hallelujah! Why did they not have any faith? Why were they so fearful? Because of how they saw him. <laughs> My Lord have mercy. Oh, children, I hope you're getting what I'm talking about today. In Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 36, let me tell you what manner of man is this. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace, by Jesus Christ. And then in parentheses, we read a phrase. He is Lord of all. Hallelujah. Oh my God, you know why you don't get your miracle? You know why you don't get your healing? You know why you can't get your prayers answered? You know why you can't receive what you need to receive? You know why you can't walk in divine favor? You know why you can't walk in blessing? Because, honey, you ain't never looked at Jesus and seen Him and understood Him as Lord of all. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. When you understand He's Lord of all, you understand understand that's why he can cast out devils that's why he can heal the blind and deliver the dead that's why he can call Lazarus out of the tomb and that's why he can calm the raging sea with the sound of his voice because he's not Lord of one issue or one issue or another issue or that issue he is Lord of all he's in control of all of it hallelujah all of your circumstance all your situation, all of your trouble and tribulation and trial answers to him. He is Lord of all. And when you learn to look at him and see him as Lord of all, all of a sudden you'll find 
that your prayers start getting answered. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. James chapter 2 and 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. James says, <laughs> our Lord Jesus Christ, He is the Lord of glory. Hallelujah. Oh my God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect or mature, grown, established. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Listen to what Paul writes in verse 8, 1 Corinthians 2. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Oh, who you see when you look at Jesus makes all the difference in the world. Psalm 24, 7 through 10. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and see King of glory, excuse me, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Hallelujah. Isaiah 35, 4 through 6. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense or with repayment. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. When did the prophet say all these things were going to happen? When their God showed up. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you. It depends on who you see. When you look at Jesus, if all you see is a man, if all you see is the creation of God, if all you see is the second person of the Holy Trinity, folks. I grew up in that. I'm going to tell you something. That lessens Jesus. That makes Him number two out of three. That makes Him subservient to God, it distracts and takes away from the fact that according to Isaiah, His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He don't have to ask Daddy to do nothing. He does it for Himself. Hallelujah. He actually gave it away when He was speaking to His disciples at one point. He said, you haven't asked anything in my name up to this point. He said, but from here on out, if you ask anything in my name, he said, the Father will do it that he might be glorified through the Son. Then he goes on and he said, ask anything in my name. And then he slips and he says, and I will do it for you. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. Depends on who you see. Oh, I'm going to tell you. 
When I look at Jesus, I see the Lord of glory. When I look at Jesus, I see the King of glory. When I look at Jesus, I see the everlasting Father. When I look at Jesus, I see God eternal. Hallelujah. And therefore, I know that when I ask Him anything in His name, glory to God, there is nothing that is impossible for Him. My faith is not hindered by how I look at him mm -hmm. because I see him correctly. I see him for who he is. Hallelujah. In John chapter 14, verses 11 through 14, almost done. Believe me, the Lord said, that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do. Because I go unto my Father, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Depends on who you see. Makes all the difference in the world. If you see the Lord, Jesus Christ is merely a man, or if you see Him as a subservient figure who must beg the Father to get things done, you will lose out on any possibility of a miracle. To receive, you must see Him as the King of Glory. Hallelujah. You must see Him as the King of Glory. And when you see Him as the King of Glory, nothing can be withheld from you. For in the end, your faith alone is not able to work for you. Why? Because it also depends on who you see. Hallelujah. Amen. There is an old...